Well, as the moderator for the first session, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ock Pannenberg. I used to work for the World Bank, uh, one of these international organizations that has mandatory retirement, and they throw you out. So. <laughs> but retirement turns out to be an illusion. So I'm glad to still be uh, able to be of service for this uh, um, session, which I think is uh, kind of interesting in the sense that uh, we can hear as what happened uh, over the last half year when the global HRH agenda kind of accelerated with the uh, meetings in uh, Recife in uh, Brazil, and then more recently with the Prince Maidol um, conference in um, Thailand. Uh, several interesting outcomes were presented there, which we will hear about today. And our first speaker uh, today will be uh, Estelle Quinn. Estelle has been uh, with USAID uh, for a long time, I may say, over 20 years, I think, if I recall correctly. And she has actually been at the very start to, uh, to uh, formulate the very beginning of the HRH, global HRH movement uh, that started around that time. Uh, we have one hour until the uh, questions, so without, uh, we're already running kind of late. So Estelle, if you could share that with us, your first presentation, and then after that we We'll welcome Rebecca Wheeler from WHO. Good morning. My job today is to help set the scene a little bit for, um, for the roundtables that you're going to be having. And so, thank you. And so I'd like to start out by showing you two maps. They're kind of the kind of maps you'd look at if you were a little bit drunk, I guess. But they compare the burden of disease with the availability of the health workforce. And you can see on the top how um, Africa looks, looks very bloated, like it's, like it's got a problem. And it does have a problem, and that is that it has a very large proportion of the world's disease burden. But if you look at the bottom map, where the continents don't even really look recognizable, that's because, for example, Africa, I don't know, looks a little bit more like the shape of Thailand, I think. And that shows you the availability of the health workforce comparatively. The countries in the dark, dark blue are the ones that have the very lowest um, distribution and availability of healthcare workers. And so we can see from this that there's really a global problem here um, and that it has a lot to do with both the production and the distribution of the healthcare workforce, globally actually. The next slide compares some, um, both worldwide and in the US, the amount of funding that is spent on total health expenditure, on health overall, and the amount that's spent on health education. And you can see that really worldwide, it's less than 2% of all the money. This is from at least 1910, um, showing figures from, yeah, from these, these are all from a Lancet report that came out in, in 2010 that I'll tell you more about in a minute. But you can see that even in the United States, with all that we spend on health, we still spend a very small proportion, a half of a percent, on health education. In 2008, there was a global task force on scaling up education and training for health workers. And it estimated that about 26 billion US dollars were required to educate and train the projected 1.5 million healthcare workers that were needed in Africa alone. So we can see that countries need to establish a better balance and make more resources available for health professional and non-professional health education um, to be able to relax a little bit this pressure that we saw that countries are under on those maps that we just looked at. This next slide shows you that the production challenge is coupled with other challenges faced by the health system. These include the epidemiologic and demographic transitions that Kate just talked about a little bit with changing um, the types of diseases that healthcare workers and the health system will have to confront. It has to do with the professional differentiation. In other words, there's a lot of specialization. Part of this means that there's a lot of specialization 
among healthcare workers today. And there's a great deal more knowledge and effort that needs to go into learning about those different specializations and the different points of service delivery. We not only have service delivery sites, but services are delivered at home, services are delivered within the community. So there's a lot of uh, differentiation going on in the health system as well. And then population demands. Uh, we all know that the, um, that the elderly, the number of elderly is growing daily worldwide, really, and that this will put additional stresses on the expense of the health system and on the services that the health system needs to provide. And finally, technological innovation. The emphasis on the mobile phone that Kate just talked about and many, many others that need to be uh, confronted and healthcare workers need to be trained in those technologies and that all implies more expense also for the health system. This next slide shows the interconnectedness of the education system and the health system and the health labor market and how the education system can help to meet health system needs. In other words, all of this is interconnected. That we can't just think about health education as an isolated activity. It has to do with the health labor market. Countries need to look at their health labor market, determine how many healthcare workers need to be trained, determine what that would cost, determine what type of education is needed, look at other issues that are influencing the health labor market, and finally, there's also an impact on the health system, and the health system also feeds into these. So we're really working with a rather complex and interrelated set of systems, and the education system and the reforms that need to occur within it are all connected to other issues as well. This next slide shows that there are two aspects, really, of health education reform, institutional design and instructional design. And today, we're going to focus on Capacity Plus's work in institutional design, which you can tell from here is divided into three overall areas. And you'll hear more about them as the morning goes on. The systemic level, the organizational level, and finally, the global level. Stewardship and governance are important at the systemic level, as is financing, resource generation, and service provision. But then we have to consider as well the institutions themselves, the organizational level, the ownership, affiliation, internal structure of those institutions, and some of the roundtables are going to deal specifically with those issues. And finally, at the global level, stewardship is important as well. In a way, those of us working for a major donor are part of that stewardship activity. And networks and partnerships. It's, this is not done by one organization alone or by one donor alone. It has to do with, with partnerships and networks at the country level and also at the community level. And we'll hear more about that as well. This slide shows you the cover of a report which many of you are probably familiar with already. A lot of the new thinking around the education reform and the, ed and the needs of, the ed of educational reform for healthcare professionals today are discussed in this report, which is the report of the Commission on Education of Health Professionals for the 21st Century. It was led by Lincoln Chen and Julio Frank, and The Lancet picked it up and published it in 2010. The report has initiated really a whole movement, but it also picked up, I think, on some, uh, some places where, uh, particularly Canada I'm thinking about, where education reform was already very important. And they were looking at some of the ideas and working with some of the ideas that actually went into this report. And some of the key recommendations are listed here. The need for competency-based curricula. This is not new. Those of you from JPIGO and those of you working with, with USAID know that we've been looking at competency-based curricula and, and, and training methodologies for a very long time. The creative use of information communication technologies is only growing and growing every day. 
Finally, transformative learning. And what does that really mean? Because the title of this slide is even Transformative Health Professional Education, which is really the name given to this by the, the Commission for the 21st Century. And if you look at that report, there's something very interesting. One, it has many interesting things in it, but one that I found most interesting is that it looks at different levels of learning. And it talks about informative learning, when students come to medical school, what you really want to give them is a lot of good information so that they can, they can do their jobs. But also, there's formative education, and that's the professionalization process. You get professionals, not just experts, out of formative education. But lastly, and perhaps most importantly for where we're going, is what's called transformative education. And the outcome of that is really leaders and change agents. And what this report talks about is trying to address inequities in healthcare access and quality. And you can get to those, the report maintains, by taking a transformative education approach. And that's what the authors and the commission of, that, that wrote this report is really looking at. What do we need to do to change things. The 21st century is very different from the 20th century, let alone the 19th century. And it's based also on the fact that 2010, I think, was the 100th anniversary of a report on medical education by a man named Flexner. And they wanted to revisit. Flexner looked at what had been done or what needed to be done in the 20th century to help to bring medicine along and to bring medical education along with the advances that could happen in medicine. And so this commission went and revisited that report, but in the context of what needed to happen to make healthcare more equitable and more quality oriented in the 21st century. And it's really a seminal report. So the Prince Mahidol Awards Conference is held every year. It's sponsored by the Ministry of Health in Thailand and the, and the um, royal family. And if you haven't been to a Prince Mahidol Awards Conference, I would advise you to try to go. It's one of the best conferences, really, that you could attend in our field. It's extremely well organized. And it has a lot of spirit. It tends to look at health very holistically, I think, and gets everyone involved. Um, and each year, they choose a different theme. The theme this past January was transformative learning for health equity. And of course, the commission report that I just talked about had some influence there. And there were four sub-themes for the conference, instructional dimensions of health professional education, institutional dimensions, particularly the institutional one that you're going to talk about more here today. But it also looked at health worker education, training, and deployment. And finally, changing context and impact on the health labor market and training. And so the, the conference was divided into a series of, of, of plenaries, of course, and parallel sessions that addressed each of these themes. USAID was, is, is usually very deeply involved in helping to organize the conference, as is the World Bank and JICA, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the China Medical Board. And this year, we were also very happy to be on the Joint Secretariat and on the International Organizing Committee, as we have been in the past. The report of the conference should be coming out also very shortly. So what were some of the key themes that were discussed and some of the um, conclusions that we could take away? One is that institutions need to get out of ivory towers and into their communities if we really want to look at um, what are the needs of the populations that healthcare workers, particularly professional healthcare workers, will serve. Also, we need to address structural inequities and of, above all, the social determinants of health. So we're really broadening the perspective that let's say medical students or nursing students or any other healthcare providers would get in their pre-service education. We need to increase the social accountability of schools. When I first heard that, it's a totally new concept. I don't think that usually medical schools have looked at in the past their social accountability of schools, students, and the graduates. We need to engage and empower communities to be involved in asking for the type of health services that they need so that educational institutions can provide that. Of course, there's a big leap between those two steps, and that's part of what we're all working on, is to help to make that connection clearer and make it happen. 
We want to collaborate also across cadres of health workers and sectors. They talk a lot in the Commission's report also about uh, team-based service provision, which many of us have already been involved in, but also the importance of looking at um, uh, different sectors. What is, and that's what we're trying to do here today, I think, look across the education sector to the health system and back and forth. Um, finally, or next to finally, measure and evaluate process and the outcome of transformative education. Uh, we need to do more with the evaluation of education programs and what they're getting us. And finally, gather evidence on what works, in what context, and how. So I think if you look at these overall, you can see that there's really an effort to, um, to bridge the divide between educational institutions and the communities they serve. What's implied here, I think, is a much more hands-on approach um, to education, to developing education, to developing the capacity also of educational, health educational institutions, and um, looking more at the populations that need to be served. And we can go back to those first two maps with the burden of disease that I showed you. Sorry. I guess I should have highlighted these all along. So USAID has a very long history, and many of you in this room might already know of that or have been involved in it, I'm sure, with educating and training a wide range of healthcare cadres, really since the mid-1980s, if not before. And we've tried over all these years, which is just about the time that I started at USAID, to um, evolve our approach to training and health education. And I think we've been a part of this movement for a long time, and there's still a lot more that can be done, and we need to be able to build on that foundation. At the PMEC, we supported a number of different side sessions and parallel sessions as well as, as plenaries. Um, which dealt with some of the advances that we've worked on over the last few years, including this emphasis on the continuum of learning, what happens in in-service uh, training that can help to better connect pre-service education with what the needs are on the job of healthcare providers. Also, integrating improvement competencies into health worker education. We've done a whole lot over the years, and, and some of you, of course, have worked on this, with quality improvement and the integration of quality improvement methodologies and quality collaboratives at the service delivery site. But now there's thought and work on integrating those methodologies and this learning about quality improvement at the pre-service level so that we can begin to instill really a culture of quality and make this something that healthcare workers already know when they get to the service delivery site. There are many private sector models for pre-service education, and USAID has worked with, um, on that with both APT Associates and uh, with Capacity Plus. There's also a health workforce response that's needed to meet these economic and demographic changes and transitions that we're going through. And um, I believe Kate was involved in that session, and she and I collaborated with someone from the World Bank as well to develop a parallel session on that, on those issues. And fi almost finally, integration of leadership skills development into health worker pre-service education. This was something that I managed to work on with MSH, which has done, as you all know, a great deal on leadership development and management training, particularly at the in-service level. But now there's also a need to look at leadership training at the pre-service level. And MSH has partners and networks in Egypt and in Kenya that are working on developing um, new medical schools or integrating training into, in leadership development into pre-service education. It was very interesting. There was at the PMAC um, uh, uh, in one of the sessions a presentation on a relatively new medical school in the Philippines that is affiliated with a business school and offers a combined MD and MBA degree. It's a very interesting um, uh, linking, and I think we're going to be seeing more of these types of innovations. 
And finally, strengthening school institutional capacity in supporting school scale up. This is something that the Capacity Plus project has developed many tools for, or a number of tools for, that you're going to be hearing about today. So I wish you all a very good morning, and I, I, I hope that this has helped to provide some background and some of the key thoughts that um, are the basis to the work that's been done. Thank you. <laughs>